Hey, it's Tom from Texas and it's time for another floppy deep dive. And it's another 100 degree day here, but we're gonna be playing some Commodore 64 and Nintendo Entertainment System today. And I've got my systems all loaded up and we're gonna be checking out games that start with the letter D today. And of course, there's huge differences between the Commodore and the NES and how the NES could, you know, put stuff within their cartridges to make it even better. But that's what makes this so fun, just checking out the little differences where a guy like me who grew up with the Commodore 64, what did I experience versus someone down the street that owned an NES? So let's go ahead, pull up a chair, grab a joystick, and let's get this party started. Ah, uh, the classic Donkey Kong, a true pioneer of arcade gaming. This iconic platformer introduced the world to our beloved hero, Mario. It's a timeless adventure that has captured the hearts of countless gamers. And I remember riding my bike down to Max Grocery Store as a kid for some candy and baseball cards. It was the only place in town with Donkey Kong. I remember spending my change on the game and then not having enough money left to get candy. Tough choice as a kid. But then I got it at home on my Commodore 64 and now I didn't have to spend quarters on it any longer. Now let's delve into the world of home consoles and compare the C64 and the NES version of this arcade masterpiece. The Commodore 64 version of Donkey Kong was released by Atari Soft in 1983. It's a faithful port of the original arcade game with some minor differences. The game featured four levels, each with its own unique layout and challenges. And the graphics and sound are not as good as the arcade version, but are still impressive for the time and reviews of the games are generally positive with most people praising it as being faithful port to the original and a worthy home version of the game. The NES version of Donkey Kong was released in 1986 and it was a simplified version of the arcade game. It only had three levels missing the cement factory level from the original. The graphics were less de detailed and more pixelated and the animation was choppy. And the sound effects were less realistic sounding more like beeps and boops and the gameplay was easier and less varied as the enemies moved slower and there were fewer obstacles. Overall, I preferred the Commodore 64 version. It was a faithful port and the had additional level made it a winner for me. Now let's move on to the next game. Ah, Dig Dug, an arcade classic from the 80s that takes me back. I remember riding my bike to the arcade behind Mott's Five and Dime just to play this gem. You control Dig Dug, a tough little guy armed with an air pump, digging through dirt, taking on enemies, and strategically bursting them. It's all about quick reflexes and smart moves, and the arcade version was pure nostalgia. But it made its way to the Famicom and to the Commodore 64, so now you could play this awesome game at home. So let's check out the Commodore 64 and the Famicom version. Nope, it was never released on the NES. So let's check it out. So first we're gonna look at the C64 version of Dig Dug, and it was pretty cool, a faithful port of the smooth graphics and addictive gameplay. But you know what's even cooler? People are still writing software for the Commodore 64, and just this month, Dig Dug Revival came out. But the Commodore 64 had a classic charm, and we all know that it was a port over from Atari, and they just did a great job on it, and one of the classic, one of my favorites to play on my Commodore 64. On the other hand, Dig Dug only came out on the Famicom version, captured the whole arcade uh, ambiance and all the magic of Dig Dug, excitement of the inflating the enemies and taking them out strategically, it was all there. So if you want an authentic arcade action and a taste of the future, you might test out Dig Dug Revival for the Commodore 64, but you can't go wrong playing Dig Dug on the NES version, it's just pure gold. If you love medieval strategy games, you might have heard of Defender of the Crown for the Commodore 64 and the NES. But let's be honest, the C64 version is superior. Graphics on the C64 are vibrant, detailed, and boast better animation, while the NES version appears pixelated and lacks finesse. And the C64 fantastic soundtrack by Jim Cuomo is memorable, while the NES sound falls short. And in terms of gameplay, the C64 offers more depth with unique character choices, events, and options 
while the NES version is limited. So in conclusion, the best Defender of the Crown experience, choose the Commodore 64. Its superior graphics, captivating sound, and engaging gameplay make it a true medieval hero. Let's move on to the next one. So if you're liking this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. So next up, we're going to be diving into the unforgettable Dragon Slayer, comparing the C64 versus the NES ports. And you know what they say about both these versions? Prepare to die a lot. First up, the Commodore 64 version. Sure, it's not Laserdisc and can't match the sheer brilliance, but one thing's for sure, dying in this game is inevitable. The graphics do their best to pay homage to the arcade and the controls are decent enough, but don't be fooled, this adventure will test your patience and resilience. And on to the NES version, completely different than the arcade, because the only thing's the same is dying is the name of the game here too. Although the graphics boost a splash of color, it's a far cry from the arcade's enchanting animation. And those controls, let's just say, they can lead you to some genuinely unfair deaths. But the bottom line here, both ports share one striking similarity with the arcade, the knack for dying repeatedly. But let's be honest, neither fully captures the magic we cherished in the original. So my fellow gamers, if you dare to take on the challenge, prepare for an onslaught of deaths, no matter which version you choose. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So next up is Double Dragon, and Double Dragon is a beat-em-up video game that debuted in 1987. And it was one of the top arcade games in America for two years in a row in 88 and 89. And it's considered to have ushered in the golden age for the beat-em-up genre, which influenced many other games like Ninja Gaiden and also Golden Axe and many more. And I love Double Dragon, love the button-mashing, fighting games back from the 80s. So now we're going to look at the ports that went over to the Commodore 64 and the NES. Let's start with the Commodore 64 version. To put it bluntly, it was a huge disappointment, a letdown with a capital D, or should I see C for crap. The graphics glitch was too obvious, splitting the fighter at the waist and making it look like they're escapees from some bizarre magician act. Sizing issues were also awkwardness, and the fighters appearing too small in their surroundings, and supposedly giant characters turning out smaller than their peers. But let's move on to the NES version, the one that stole our hearts. Released in 88 by Trade West, the NES version wild players with its top-notch graphics, music, and addictive gameplay. And it captured the spirit of the arcade. And Kanazuka's unforgettable tune like the title theme in Mission 4 added to the thrill. Sure, it had a few differences from the arcade like being only one player and some level variations. But overall, it faithfully delivered the Double Dragon experience we crave. So the verdict is in. The NES version reigns supreme as the most faithful, enjoyable Double Dragon rendition. Where the Commodore 64, well, it was just a major disappointment. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. So next, we're putting Dick Tracy to the test. No holds bar. Let's dive in and compare these versions. First up, the Commodore 64 version of Dick Tracy. The game features a flick screen shoot 'em up with five levels of a dozen or so screens each, and players control Tracy on a rescue mission to save Tess Trueheart. While the Commodore 64 offers a nostalgic charm, it falls short with blocky graphics and repetitive gameplay. Now let's shift our focus to the NES version. It boasts improved visuals and smoother animations and delivers a slightly more polished experience with driving and sniping element. And it adds some diversity, but it does not elevate the game to greatness. The Commodore 64 version suffers from prehistoric program and simplistic gameplay. Its flickering screen style might not even resonate with everyone and the graphics leave something to be desired. And then on the other hand, the NES version driving and sniping elements provide some variety, but it still falls short from the shallow mechanics and unimpressive graphics. And in this head-to-head -head comparison, neither version comes out a clear winner. Oh, I'd say both games are terrible. I didn't enjoy playing either one of them, so let's move on to the next one. Our seventh game on the list is Die Hard, so brace yourself for the verdict. Die Hard on the Commodore 64 delivers the action-packed essence of the movie as John McClane takes down Gruber's gang and rescues hostages in this 
atmospheric adventure. And on the NES, Die Hard stays true to the film's plot, offering various endings based on your choices, and then engage in intense combat and tackle the challenges ahead. Now, let's get real about the gameplay. The Commodore 64 version nails the atmosphere, but the aggressive clock and the limited guidance can be frustrating. And the NES is faithful to the movie, but the clunky controls may deter some players. So, bottom line, Commodore 64 version brings the Die Hard experience to life, but falls short due to its flaws. The NES may not be perfect, but it's a better choice for fans who want to relive the movie's intensity. Now, Die Hard for the NES wins the showdown. So next up, we're going to be looking at Double Dragon 2 The Revenge. And we're going to be looking at the original arcade version before we jump over to the C64 and NES. And that Double Dragon 2 hit the scene back in 1987, impressing players with intense action and a captivating soundtrack. And the smooth gameplay and just fantastic visuals made it into an instant hit. The game has four awesome missions, a heliport, a lumber storehouse, a wheat field, and an enemy's hideout. And each mission had its own boss and sub-bosses, as well as many familiar enemies from the first game, but with new looks and attacks. And the game had a new control scheme that used two directional based attack buttons instead of punch and kick buttons. Now let's dive into the conversions. First up, the Commodore 64. Unfortunately, this one fell short of expectations. The graphics appeared grainy and blocky and not utilizing the full potential of the C64 capabilities. The sound effects were lackluster and the controls feel somewhat sluggish. On the other hand, we had the NES version of Double Dragon 2 and oh boy, what an improvement. The controls have been fine-tuned, allowing for smoother close-quarter combat and satisfying combo moves. Plus, the addition of two-player co-op gameplay is a definite bonus, making it even more enjoyable. And after comparing both versions, it's clear the NES takes the crown here. The attention to the detail and the visuals and animation is remarkable for 8-bit technology. And the gameplay is refined, offering more variety and fairer combat. And let's not forget the joy of teaming up with a friend in co-op mode. Double Dragon 2 on the NES is a definitely winner. But Double Dragon 2 was definitely an improvement over Double Dragon on the Commodore 64. So there you have it, folks. Let's move on to the next one. So next up, we're going to be looking at Donkey Kong Jr. And in this Donkey Kong Jr., it's the only game where Mario's the villain and Donkey Kong is the hero. And Donkey Kong Jr. was the first Nintendo game to feature a playable animal character. And it was originally going to be called Donkey Kong 2, but Nintendo changed the name to avoid confusion with the arcade sequel. Donkey Kong Jr. was one of the first games to use a D-pad controller, which later became the standard for Nintendo consoles. And Donkey Kong Jr. was the second best-selling game of 1982, right behind Pac-Man. So now let's look at the two ports for the NES and the C64. So first up, we're going to look at the C64 homebrew version of Donkey Kong Jr. And it's just like the arcade, and they based it off the Atari 7800 version of the arcade classic. And it's really got a cool retro vibe going on, and I really like this uh, port that they did on, in 2014 that came over to the Commodore 64. But let's switch gears and talk about the NES port of Donkey Kong Jr., it was based off the arcade game, and I think it really does bring that magic to the NES of this game. Has the four stages, has the same bad guys, and it's definitely one that I like to play. So, the lowdown on the both of them, I think they're both really close to the arcade. I enjoyed playing both of them, and I say it's a toss. So I'm going to have my audience, the community, tell me which one do you think is best, the Commodore 64 homebrew or the original NES version? Let me know down in the comments. Let's move on to the next one. And today we're celebrating Double Dribble, an iconic basketball video game developed and released by Konami in 1986. The arcade version of Double Dribble was a trailblazer in its time, setting new standards for sports video games with its fast-paced action and detailed players and a large side-scrolling court. 
It was considered the most realistic basketball game upon release, but what truly captivated players was those innovative cinematic slam dunks and animation sequences, features that were rare in video games back then. And as the popularity of Double Dribble soared in the arcade, it made its way to home gaming platforms including the Commodore 64 and the NES. Now let's begin by comparing the Commodore 64 and the NES versions of the game. On the Commodore, Double Dribble retained much of its charm, but it had a few shortcomings. Though it offered a decent basketball experience, the graphics were a little less impressive and not as uh, readable as the arcade version. And some players found it slightly harder to play, especially with the tempting interceptions. But nevertheless, the C64 version remained a solid basketball game, playable alone or with a friend. Now let's move on to the NES version. The game's popularity soared once again, and it became a beloved classic on the console. The NES version featured five-on-five -five action on a horizontally scrolling court and provided an immersive basketball experience. And the inclusion of the cutscenes and the speech, though limited, enhanced the game's presentation. And additionally, the NES version allowed players to choose different quarter lengths, adding to the gameplay variety. And while both versions had their strengths and weaknesses, the NES version was particularly praised for its realistic rendition of basketball. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a wrap. That's all the games on the Commodore and NES, and now it's your turn to go down in the comments and tell me which of these games did you play? Which of these games, which system did you prefer it on? I'd love to hear it. I learned so much from my community when they give me their insight. So please go down and share. And so until next time, stay creative, stay curious, and keep retro gaming. Boom.